What did it take to become the king in Ireland? Well, Dike the Eve, August Falcher. Hi, hello and welcome. Sean O'Sullivan from the Irish Pagan School. And that is where my studies are at the moment. I'm studying Kingship Ireland um, because I'm teaching a class soon at the Irish Pagan School. Or if you're seeing this in the future times, I may have already taught the class at the Irish Pagan School and you can go and look it up. Um, the There's a number of different things that people get confused about when we talk about kings and kingship in Ireland. And of course, there's very famous kings that a lot of people point out, like, you know, Brian Baru, for example, Rory O'Connor said to be the last high king of Ireland. But even that high king of Ireland was, is a bit of a misnomer in some ways. Even back to Neil Nigonach, also known as Niall of the Nine Hostages, who is a, a fascinating king that kind of bridges this position between the mythological and the historical rule of the island um but when we talk about kings in ireland it's not just one king it's not just one monarchy it's not just one top down kind of control circumstance what we need to kind of think about is the tribal nature of ireland as we look back into our past and um, before we were dominated before we were colonized like we had at one point nearly 150 different tua as they were called or tribes but the tribe wasn't just like um, a collection of singular families it was groups of families or people in certain landed territories all of which would fall under their own king their own kind of structure and their own kind of places of worship in many cases as well and um, so there was a lot of very strict kind of structures around ancient irish society and at the top was the king um, and of course if you have 150 different tuas or tribes you have 150 different kings all of which kind of are have many obligations on them like their job is to you know look after their people to provide security to kind of provide hospitality to defend their territory and also to enhance the wealth and power and prestige of their people by raiding other people's territory and so what it takes to be king is not just a case of being born into a, a, a certain bloodline of privilege. Now, there was a, a, there was bloodlines, okay? But the concept of kind of the firstborn heir guaranteeing themselves the seat of power, it, it's known as primogenitive kind of inheritance, didn't come into Ireland until the 16th century. So before that, there was... There was recognition of like you know your children or like you know your your main kind of people who are could inherit the seat of power from you and um, but it wasn't just cut and dry essentially anyone within four generations of a ruler as in your great great grandparent could make a vie for that position of power and within each tribe within each family or to a you know when it comes to the death of the ruler there would be you know people who have been earmarked people who've like you know raised towards certain things but as the popularity shifts or people would die because again mortality rates would be probably high back then um anyone could throw their hat in the ring at which point it is about getting the local support getting like you know the essentially the popular vote in order to then be put forward to the the last kind of running to decide who gets to actually sit in the big seat and there are many different kind of ways to go about that some again is to be like your direct it, it was actually known as the tarnish there um uh, which is still a word used in ireland in political circumstances now but this person was the kind of heir apparent the the nominated next in line by the previous ring like king or ruler um but it's not always guaranteed that that's the person who's going to take over because when it comes to the actual decision if someone else in the family if someone else with legal claim within that four generations of bloodline can show that they were of a higher merit in regards to raiding or in regards to defending the territory feats of valor there was actually a, a term known as uh Febus, f-e-b-a-s and it was the unique abilities of that specific person and it's that kind of almost individual dignity of that individual which was taken into consideration so you could have someone nominated tarnished to be the next in line but if they're an absolute fucking ass hat and someone else has a better range of abilities a better kind of like you know range of dignity upon them and has shown true acts of merit or valor that they will be better it's entirely possible that they would be the person put forward and selected by the rest of the tour as king now does this sound like a monarchy not really it almost sounds like democracy now in the, the where kind of when we talk about tours right we're not just talking about one family 
we're talking a number of families in a collected territory somewhere between like a couple of hundreds couple of hundred to a couple of thousand people between 15 and 25 kilometers in a territory so not everyone has the right to, to throw their name into that hat but within this kind of upper caste of direct bloodline these kind of selected individuals it was not a guaranteed like firstborn inheritance because i said that didn't come in until the 16th century um, and time and again, like there could be agreements made. And one of the more famous ones is the 600 years of rulership of the island of Ireland between the Enails, the two northern and southern O'Neill family being descended from Neil de Connacht, Nile of the Nine Hostages. And so when those families were in power, they nominated someone in the other family as their Tanishta. And so what actually happened was when the the king in one family, say the Northern Anneals died, the Southern Anneal tarnished it or like next person would step in and rule. And when that person died, it would go to the Northern Anneals. And through that, they maintained power and dominance over Ireland for 600 years. Now, that was eventually kind of toppled by the very, very famous Brian Baru who came in. But even when he eventually managed to dominate and became what many people consider like the, the the final high like you know kind of king and dominance really he wasn't high king it was king without opposition essentially um because he managed to kind of take hostages and raid and kind of campaign against so many different people he managed to do all of that but it all fell apart for him in in 1012 at the battle of clontarf against the vikings there and when he died himself um so to be a king it wasn't just a case of you're born with privilege you know you were descended from a bloodline of privilege and status yes but a lot of these bloodlines trace their, trace their lineages back to the mythological neely gonok or before that to the, the two of the danon like you know the actual ancient gods of ireland but even within there there was an element of meritocracy involved in that you had to be able to show that you're the right person for the job or the popular vote could go somewhere else and someone else would step in and take over what's interesting is though that there was ritual elements around this as well there every kind of king or place uh, kingdoms or territories of tua had their own sacred places and um, one of the more famous being brian Baru's, which is based down at thomond and um, and that place was raided and burned and if you could actually attack and raid someone else's sacred landscapes that was a real show of dominance to position yourself in you know running to be a king or to actually you know secure your location as a king but we know that there were multiple different rituals performed like there was the tower of fesh known as a blood feast a bull feast where someone would be put in pretty much into a uh, a meditative state by consuming the flesh of a bull drinking the broth and wrapping himself in a skin and then whoever they dreamed of would be declared the right king the rightful king and um, there was also kind of an inauguration feasts which could be held um, and you'd only be allowed to hold one of these a certain type of enoch or gathering um, in order to kind of show your wealth and your dominance within your kind of territory or essentially the, when you get those collectives of two as the multiple different kings following under as someone seated as a high king they from the hill of tara would be able to declare these these singular during their reign the singular kind of celebration of their rule and um, so to be a king in ireland wasn't just a case of being born lucky or being born first there was a level of meritocracy involved and you know anyone within four generations of the previous bloodline anyone who could trace their blood back to the great great grandfather who was a ruler was available to kind of step into that role so um there are many people around the world and we hear from them time and again who say that they are descended from the kings of ireland or actually there are people currently on the island who claim to be the rightful king of ireland because of their bloodline it's bullshit it really is um like brian brew had multiple children neil de Gonach, um had like absolutely multiple children rory o'connor um wasn't even the the tarnished he was one of 20 for example um and it was only when older brothers died or he outstripped them with his fevis, his proof of ability and dignity that he became high king in Ireland. Um, and he's an O'Connor. And my great granny was an O'Connor who was married to O'Connor. So who knows? You know, it is about like understanding how things have changed and how our culture has shifted, but also understanding the role of kingship. It wasn't just a person who 
got a fancy hat and sat on a fancy seat. They're, they had an obligation. They had an onus on them to provide hospitality, to provide for their people, to care for their people, so that no one would go out with hungry in like homeless, and um, that people could knock on the king's door and expect to be given shelter and food. That was an expectation. That was an obligation on them. And if they're not kind of living within right relationship within the sovereignty of the island, then very quickly their right to rule will be shown as false. Um, from the mythological eras, we know that there was. There was a thing known as a kingly judgment, and if a king gave a false judgment, that would be enough to undermine their position and their power. In the ancient laws, under um, the ancient laws, the Breton laws, there was a recognition of satire, in that if a bard, or famous or recognised bard or Philip performed a legal satire against an individual, that was the ending of their name. They could be cast out of the tour entirely and become a landless person, um, or a catalyst person which is a person with no wealth and um, so there was a lot of structure involved but kingship in ireland wasn't just again fancy hat fancy chair it was a job it was an absolute an obligation to look after your tribe to look after your tour and that did involve battling with everyone else on the island as well so hopefully this has been an interesting uh, insight into kingship in ireland as i said i'm teaching a class on the irish pagan school for it you can go and join that class i'm teaching it soon or if you're seeing this from the future i have already taught it you can find it at the irishpaganschool.com if you don't have the funds to take a class at the moment though don't worry about it we've got a year's worth of free resources available for you go to irishpagan.school forward slash free from classes to readings to like resources we are constantly kind of producing more content to educate and inspire people around irish spirituality heritage culture mythology and history so from me here Look after yourself. Until next time, Slon, goodbye.